right? Yep. Very cool. Dude, Dan, thanks for coming. Of course. Happy to be here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Oh, Eric, can you give me a beer? Yeah. Oh, my God. Another Golden Road. Another podcast requires Golden Road. Not sponsored, but hopefully soon. <laughs> Working on it. Working on that sponsorship, man. Dude, thanks for coming. Uh, I'll take the melon cart this time around. That's a good sound. That's a really good sound. Um... So let's just get into it, man. Let's tell, talk about it. Tell me, how'd you get involved with the, the Harry Nielsen record? Yeah. How'd that um, all roads lead back to Mark Hudson, mm. who produced this record. And um, my good friend and mentor, Ian McGregor, mm-hmm. uh, he engineers for Greg Wells. And he was asked to cover a session for Mark one day. Mm-hmm. And so Mark loved his work, and um, he went back to work with Greg. So next time Mark was in town, Ian referred me to him. Really cool. Yeah. And I've been with him about four years now. Yeah? Yeah. Damn. And he's a bi-coastal guy. Really? So, yeah. He's in New York a lot of the time, and when he's out here a couple times a year. Did you guys work on in L.A. together? Yes. Like, oh, okay, cool. Yep. Um, and what was like the state of the recordings? Like, did they come on cassette? Did they come on reel to reel? All over the map. Really? Truly. Wow. Yeah. Um, it was. And you did? Did you guys digitize it? Yes. Well? Wow. Yeah. All into Pro Tools. So it was a challenging project. Um, we had to find ADAT players. Yeah. To pull tracks off of. Oh my god. We had to find his Tascam Porta Studio mm-hmm. to pull tracks off of. Oh my god. That's cool. So it was on tapes, CDs. Wow. Yeah. It was an adventure. What was that? Uh, I'm eating a freaking halls. I'm sure people are fucking pissed. But I'm sorry. But so how long of, of was the digitizing process? Like, to find all that, was that a few months? Um, it was actually going through the entire project. Were there, yeah. So um, we worked on it for about two months straight. Wow. Um, we'd be stripping vocals. He'd do the arrangement. We'd be recording the musicians around it. Wow. Oh, so... So you guys, you guys tracked musicians. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So on about half of the songs, we were able to get his lead vocal solo. Oh. And we my replaced all God. the tracks. And you just followed what was there. No. Oh. No. Um. Generally, you know, the melodic structure, but would basically just scrap it and start over. Wow. Which Mark had produced the demos, okay. so he knew what the songs were. Wow. And um, they had written some of them together. Mm. So he knew them inside and out. Yeah, so he knew he knew how to do it justice. And exactly. How Harry probably would have wanted it. Exactly, yep. Wow, man, that's crazy. I didn't know, I thought that was just like reels of like fully fleshed out songs he had that you guys just mixed, but it sounds like it was really... Oh, a real serious product. It was making a record. Yeah, it yeah was you guys made a record. record. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, one or two of the songs, uh, there's a song called Listen, the Snow is Falling. Yeah. We just I love that one. We couldn't get the tapes. Mm. So that was the best shape we had it in. We overdubbed some stuff on it, some guitars and background vocals. but So, so that one's kind of uh, true to what the tape was? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, I love the way that one sounds. Cool. cool. Yeah, that's one of my favorites as well. Was there how much of like hiss and stuff did you guys have to try and remove? A lot. Really? Yeah. The tapes were kind of. I didn't mix it. Yeah. yeah thankfully. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We sent it to Mario McNulty mm-hmm. back in New York, who's a total wizard. Wow. He is like, he had been working on David Bowie's last stuff, and so he's kind of in that realm already and mm. knows ha- how to handle that kind of stuff. That's insane. What year are the tapes from? Yeah. 
Um, Eric just asked what year the tapes are from, just in case. The stuff that he and Mark were working on together were from 93, 94, which is when he passed away. Yeah. And then um, some of the other songs, there were demos going back to like the mid 80s. Wow. Yeah. And then a couple of the songs that we couldn't find the masters of, Mm -hmm. we found a company who can actually extract a lead vocal out of a mix. Wow. And so... Even without the master? Yeah. Wow. I wonder what kind of process that's like. It's just like taking out all the lows. Like, because when I... Basically, like, like DJing, you know. It's a whole, like, NASA technology. Wow. Like, we actually got the software, and I tried to do it. <laughs> and I was like, I'm sure somebody there really knows how to do it. Yeah, so. yeah. And they did a great job. Yeah, you can't even tell. Yeah. Yeah. The, the the one thing I was like, I was listening to that record, and I was like, this sounds so good. And I was like, there's no way it came out this clean. Like, there's no way you received it that clean. I you know, there had to be a lot of that. yeah, it was all over the map, truly. Like, um, was there, like, tape warp, too? Like, was there a way to get around that kind of stuff? Not really. Okay. I mean, once we had his vocals, it sort of just was as it was mm. um we are lucky that three or four songs we were able to get a clean track of yeah. lead vocals which just like made life so easy and sounded great and these these are you know definitive his last his last kind of we don't know we don't know if there's more there might be a few more yeah i mean he he and mark Did the family reach out yes oh actually um Kifo, yeah, shout son. out to Kifo. Yeah, what up, Kifo? Yeah, he played bass oh. on uh, three or four of the tracks that we cut from scratch. That's perfect. Yeah, he's a great player. He's a great player. I've only talked to him like online. Yeah, and I've seen his a, wilderness photos. He's a great guy. Yeah. Um, and uh, we had Jim Keltner play drums, mm. which was a treat for me as a drummer. Totally. Um, and he was like, "Yeah, man, you know, Kifo, his kid is a great bass player." Yeah. And if you're looking for a guy, you should bring him in. And, um, you know, Mark was nervous because he had never met him or heard him play. Mm-hmm. And he just smoked it. Wow. Yeah. So, um, and with the drummer, like, what was his what was his kit? What was his setup? Like, Jim Keltner is a unique man. Mm-hmm. And um, drum doctors came out and set up his kit. Cool. And so I was like, yeah. You know, what mics does he like? How does he usually do this? And he's like, he he never sets up his kit the same mm. way twice. Oh. So I'll put it how he liked it last time, and then he'll come in. He ended up taking the bass drum out and played an electronic kick Whoa. with an acoustic kit and uh, had two snare drums, one on each side, hi-hats, one on each side. Interesting. And... um. Yeah, in a variant of, of sounds like a high kind of snare, maybe yep. a tighter one, and yeah, um, and you know, it was a trip because he sat down and it's like he's playing this kit for the first time. Wow, and it was just a treat. Um, so building building these songs around just his vocals. So what came first was like list pretty typical like drums, bass, keys like that, or yeah. the drums coming in towards the end or. Um, For those three or four songs, we did a tracking day of drums, bass, and guitar together. With, like, scratches? Scratch? No. Uh No, just live. We had the arrangement down, and we had everything to a click at that point. Cool. So the guys had all heard the tunes, and... Could make it work. We made it work. That's insane. Yeah, which... um, Shout out to Jim Cox, too, who played keyboards on it who is a living legend. Yeah. And uh, he's out with James Taylor Mm -hmm. playing live now. And, um, I mean, he is a musical genius Mm -hmm. beyond words. Yeah. and um, Because the keys really fill up a lot of that space, you know. Right. It's all very key heavy, these like last tracks. And just any time there's a question about arrangement or chord structure. Yeah, voicings. Look at Jim. Yeah. And it's like... (laughs) Problem solved. That's insane. And he also did the string arrangement on mm. the last song, 
what does a woman see in a man, man, which is its own masterpiece, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. yeah. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. That song stuck out. Yeah. yeah. That one was a trip because we had a demo of piano and vocals, no click track, no rhythm, and we pulled the vocal out. And somehow Jim Cox played a piano part to it, just mm. free, no tempo, and then sent it to Jimmy Webb, who wrote the song, mm -hmm. to play the final piano. Then Cox did the string arrangement, mm. and it just, I was blown away when I heard it. With um, one thing I was talking to Eric about earlier was like UCLA with all the Beatle references. Yep. Was that a hairy thing that you guys took, or was that you you guys did that? Um, was there like a note somewhere that said, put the Beatle references? Well, he put his own Beatle references into the lyrics, and so Mark kind of took that and ran with it. Mm. So anytime he would call out a Beatles track, mm -hmm. you know, it would... Yeah, put the Penny Lane horn yeah, trumpet. Yeah, exactly, and a string line, and... Yeah. Uh, to come together drum fill yeah and, totally yeah oh damn yeah so that one actually was a song that um we built off of a mix okay. we didn't have the vocals for that one so that song was pretty well done when we got it and okay. we again put guitars percussion wait so you guys didn't have the vocals for it, then how'd you guys get the vocals for it? that we just had the mix oh, of oh, the song oh, 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 oh. yeah so there were, yeah damn Okay, and then there's that one. Oh man, what are the tracks that I really love on that? Woman, a woman. I like that. Yeah. One. That. Woman, a yeah. woman, a woman. Yeah, I think it's track two. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a wonderful song. Yeah. Um, Van Dyke Parks played on that song. Oh really? He did. Yeah. Oh he played, nice. Which was a very special day. Yeah. Yeah. Was he was he nice to work with? Who's a nice guy? He was the most pleasant human cool. you can imagine, and it's like he walked out of a fairy tale land mm. with his accordion and just like it was unreal. <laughs> Damn, so so you, yeah, so uh overall you think you spent like what would you say 2 months on the record or yep. more? Oh wow. And then uh, about a month of it you said was digitizing? Yeah. However, I mean, we were putting together rough mixes and cleaning tracks and Mark was going through his catalog the whole time. And yeah. a couple of songs, he'd be like, I think I found a better version of the vocals oh. on this one. So they were all pretty close, but a couple of them, like, we scrapped and put wow. new vocals in in the last few days. And then, again, thank you, Mario. Yeah. You made it sound like a record. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah, because it has, like, a very cohesive sound. I was like, oh, this must have been, like, an album he was, like, working on. It had, I, I, it didn't, it never even, like, occurred to me that, that it's just, like, like a Grey's Hits almost. Like, you know, of what was left or what was yeah. available. It was just, it was his sketch pad. Totally. And, um, he and Mark were, like, really tight for the last couple of years he was around. Yeah. And, um, you know, Nelson was effectively like retired from music. Yeah. So, so you think he was just writing for fun? Yes. Really? Yeah. He. Had, I don't think he had any plans to try and make a comeback or yeah. anything. It was just therapy wow. for the two buddies. That's crazy. Yeah. I I went and visited him. Uh, it was me and my girlfriend's second date like two years ago, and she lives in Westlake. Oh, right so, on. Um, uh, well, actually, when I first recorded my first album in 2013, we recorded in Westlake with Jonathan Rado, and he was like, "Oh, you know, Nielsen's buried here." I was like, "What? Can I we go? Can we go see him? Yeah, like, what the hell?" And then, like the whole session, um, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't have time because we were just working. And uh, uh, years later, I, I meet my girlfriend, and I was like, "Oh my god, we're in Westlake. This is where I recorded my album. Can we go see Harry Nielsen?" Yeah, and we did. We it took a while for us to find him in the cemetery, but we did. And it was like, damn. Yeah. Pay my respects. Yeah, that's it's, a it's worthy amazing. pilgrimage yeah. for sure. It's 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 awesome. It's so cool. He popped up in a while I was recording. He popped up in a dream of mine. Really? Yeah, because I think my mind was like, let's go see him. Let's go see him. So he came to me. Yeah, and for he sure. was sitting in my dad's house in the dream, uh, on the piano, and then he looked at me. He was like, "So what do you want to hear?" 
<laughs> and I was like, oh, this could be the night, like, you know, because I love that song. Right. So, and I heard him I, in my head, him on piano playing This Could Be the Night. And I woke up, I was like, what a weird dream. Shit. <laughs> I was like, yeah, let's keep recording. That's great. Now. And I mean, I can hear a connection between him and your yeah. music, too. So. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a big, definitely a huge influence on me. Like, so when I saw you post on Facebook that you worked on the record, I was like, oh my God, we got to sit down and talk about this. Yeah, no, I'm so glad you reached out. Yeah. It was like the project of a lifetime, truly. Oh, man. Um, Are you guys working on any records right now? Um, We just finished another in December. And Mark is back in New York with Mario, again, mixing. Wow. That was Um, with... Same kind of style, like a older... Lost kind of tape thing? Or? Um, no, actually. Mm. Uh, it's Joey Mullins' record, who was in Badfinger. Yeah. Guitar and vocals. He is our last remaining Badfinger. Cool. And, um, you know, he had a trove of songs that... That's awesome. That they're Badfinger songs. They're, That's cool. They're the shit. They sound, they sound like Badfinger? Do you oh, yeah. write them around? Or no, they're new songs. Yeah. That sound Or, like. you know, just stuff he's had kicking around forever. So, again, him and Mark are old buddies, and um, so Mark did most of the arrangements. Joey wrote most of the lyrics. Um, Mario recorded it in New York, and then they came out here, and I Mm. tracked all the lead vocals. With um, tracking the drums, are you guys doing that classic Ringo towels on each tom kind of thing, like a deader sound? Um, When we did Keltner, you know, I just... Let him do his thing. I let him do his yeah. thing, yeah. Which was actually more wide open and, mm-hmm. you know, wallet on the snare, mm. the classic thing. Yeah, yeah. But he had an electronic kick drum, so yeah. it was just, like, all the rules out the window. Interesting. Um, what what what'd you think of the electronic kick drum? And yeah. I mean, it sounded great. Yeah. That's the kick drum on the record. Yeah. And um, it was cool because... I think it just gives, like, a really nice punch versus, like, you know, using... Yeah, it. it was easy to record. Yeah, totally. Just, just that <laughs> um and then it was also cool because each mm-hmm. song he would go out and pick whatever kick drum he thought was mm. genre appropriate damn so he was like you know he was in yeah, it yeah i guess it gives you a little more flexibility like i think kick is so important but we don't really think about it yeah as being as important as it should be yeah and uh that's crazy and what what uh well, well i was gonna ask what kind of mic you put on there but it's electronic but what kind of would you put on there um I like the Shure Beta 52. Cool. And then I always put a FET U47 on mm. the outside to get the rumble, mm. which is more of like the classic Bonham sort yeah, of kick totally. sound. Yeah. Is that the first drummer you fell in love with, John Bonham? No. Uh, Travis Barker was. Yeah, you of know, course. Yeah, yeah. It was you the had era. To. Yeah, it was for the sure. era. And I was working at Mike's Drum Shop in Santa yeah, Barbara. Yeah, shout out to Mike's. And. Every kid that was taking lessons was Port bringing, pie kits. yeah, was bringing Blink in. So cool. Uh, John Bonham came to me later in life. I actually didn't get into John Bonham until I took lessons at Mike's. Really? Because my drum teacher was obsessed with him. Yeah. So then I they got I got off like the Travis Barker vibe and went into the Bonham vibe. Yeah. Heavy bass drum. Oh yeah. Doing those kind of rolls on with the bass drum. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I probably went. Like Travis to Dave Grohl to John Bonham, yeah, just straight through. Hell yeah, that's awesome, man. I miss Mike's drum shop. We don't have like a, a drum shop in San Bernardino. Right, we don't. We're, yeah, I guess you have to we, go instrumental. Yeah, and it's they a just sad got, like, thing. Sticks like we have not the instrumental, but it's not. Yeah, a thank you guys. Drum shop. Yeah, um, George, who owned Mike's drum shop, mm-hmm. he's running the Rock Shop Academy there, which is great. It's still great, yeah. Um, I, I, I feel now as like I get older, I see those kids graduate and they do, they do start bands. Like there is like, yeah, it is leading to kids just starting bands. I'm great. glad you see that. I'm out of touch with Santa yeah. Barbara music at this point, which is so. a sad thing for me, Yeah, but I'm glad that they're still playing and there's a spot they can go. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if there's a lot of spots you can play, but there's a spot you can go to learn. And- right. To be a band Before you like move that. to LA and <laughs> start a real band, <laughs> exactly. That's basically it. You hit like a, a like a, a ceiling in Santa Barbara. Yeah, you play Soho so many times. You're like, okay, time to yeah challenge myself, which is which is good. But it will always be home. 
It will, man. There's there's no better feeling than like driving back. Even right. when you just go there for like a few days, it's like, oh, this is nice. Yep. It's all the same. It's a beautiful thing. Oh, I love it. Yeah. How long have you been living in LA? Uh, 12 years. And did you come here for like you know, work, recording and all that? How'd you get into Yeah, recording? I went to the LA recording school cool. when I was 21, 22. Cool. And um, I ended up working with Rick Parker, Mm -hmm. who was, like, doing Black Rebel and stuff like that. He had his own studio, which closed, unfortunately. Yeah. And, um, yeah, just been at it ever since. That's crazy. Yeah. Is is that, like, a great way to do it through the recording school and then you can meet people? Yeah. Um, I mean. There's lots of ways to do it, but did you, like, go in that way through the school? Yeah. I mean, there's... There's a stigma for some people about Mm -hmm. going to music school or recording, Mm -hmm. but the gig that I ended up getting after Rick, uh, which was with a composer named Gustavo Farias, Mm -hmm. you know, it was like I walked into his studio, he saw my resume, and he's like, all right, I have a 60-channel Neve board. Do you know how to use it? I was like, I I do know how to use it. And he's like, great, come on Monday. Cool. So it was totally worth it. To me, um, that's not how everybody gets their start. For a lot of that orchestra stuff, I imagine like you're gonna use all sixty channels. Huh? Many times, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We ended up recording a lot in Europe when we were mm-hmm. doing like a real orchestra. Wow. But yeah, we put that thing to use for sure. That's crazy. And you could feel the difference with the knee board. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's insane. Yeah, miss that thing. Yeah, <laughs> I do too. I haven't even used it, but I miss it. <laughs> I miss it. You will, and you'll fall in love. <laughs> I'm nervous. I'm nervous to get around good gear because then I'll just want it. So are you producing your own stuff? Yeah, me and Eric do a lot of it um, in this room. Um, Eric does his own stuff too, and, you know, kind of just like learning. And well, Eric's been doing it for a while, and I don't know, Eric, what do you think? Yeah, just messing around. Messing but... around, yeah. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Like we did uh, our last record in Santa Barbara in Orange Whip. Oh, nice. Not in his studio, but he let us use the lobby. Oh, cool. Where Tom was. Yeah. And we yeah, just yeah. kind of like set up our gear there. And it was just like, we, I gave him a month's worth of rent and he let us record in there. I love it. Those yeah. guys are the best. Yeah. Those super guys sweet. are the best. And we just like, you know, how come that guitar sounds thin? And then we're like, we YouTube it or Google it. Mm, okay, let's move it. And then it's like right. a lot of like trial and error, which is why it took so long to do like 10 songs. I think we did like nine or 10 songs. Yep. Learned a lot. Good. Learned a lot on that. Especially because we did that one all digital. Like, our previous records were all on tape, and uh, that makes more sense to me. Right. Because just record. You know. Yeah. I, I haven't tracked a lot on tape. Um, I'll often do, like, drums and bass on tape, mm. and then... Bounce them out. Bounce them out, and do the rest in the Bro Tools. I've done that, too, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um I played drums on a couple of records on tape That's when cool. I was a kid, so I got to be around it, but yeah. as soon as I went to work, it was all computer land. Yeah, Pro Tools. Pro Tools has that like a free one now. Yeah, they it's do. It's like you get like three folders or three tracks. Yeah, I know. I push that on all my younger clients. Totally. They're I like, oh, learned. what should I get? Dude, free Pro Tools. Free Pro Tools. Get it. Learn like how to use it, and you, know, you write like three songs, and then you max out or whatever the case may be and then yeah then you start spending money and That's you're in the rabbit ya. hole how they get ya but yeah i like uh, you know i like i like logic we've been using logic recently like he, he's recently switched over well you're still using both i kind of go back and forth. he goes back right. and forth yeah but um logic's like garage band man any kid who grew up with garage band they gotcha it works yeah they gotcha um yeah, it works i've been collabing with a buddy of mine in san diego mm-hmm. who records a lot of jazz and he does everything in Logic, and he oh, likes cool. to actually have me come down and mix there versus like send it to me. So I'm just like dipping my toes like in the water. No, no, no. Uh, I I do like mixing, but trying to finish a mix is an ordeal. Yeah, that's why I love guys like Mario. Yeah, or like Ian that I can just send it, fire and- it off, and they make me sound better than I am. <laughs> That's like the whole thing. Like I'm, I'm mixing right now, and it's kind of like, can you turn this little thing up? Can you turn this thing down? Like, ah, fuck it, I'm a suck for the for my buddy Patrick, who's, who's yeah, you know. 
It goes deep. Yeah. 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 Imagine just getting all those tiny little. I don't know. I don't think I. Think, I don't think I like the double take vocal anymore. Could I hear it single? And it's just like, motherfucker. You yeah. s- why'd you double it? Yeah. But then again, like while we're recording, I'm like, well, we might as well just double it just in case because we don't know. Just so we have it. Just so we have it. Just, right. That's like always like just so we have it. Just so we have it. I have been doing like some little projects with younger hip hop guys, mm. which is kind of fun in a way mm-hmm. because they come in. They do their vocal Mm -hmm. and they go like, all right, bounce it. And I'm like, here you go. And then like, it's on SoundCloud the next day. That's crazy. I'm like, okay. So, cause they already had the beat. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, that's the end of that project. (laughs) Moving on. (laughs) See you later. And they don't, do they do doubles and stuff like that? I'm sure they, oh, they do the ad libs. Yeah. Yeah. No, they actually stack it up. Really? Yeah. More than you might think. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even know what, so where they just like do one take of it. One take, doubles, triples, harmonies wow. that you might not realize are there, yeah. layered in. And then they mix it themselves, huh? Yeah. Or do you do, you do like a rough... Uh, it's usually mix. just when we're sitting there in the room, you know, That's they're insane. updating the gram, <laughs> I'm balancing their vocals, and then... They got time for that kind the, of stuff, The man. song's done. It's a little different when you're in your band. <laughs> it's just, yeah. It's just a little it's, different. It's a different universe. Yeah, man. It's just like everyone's like, what do you think of that tone? What do you think about that part? Oh, it's a little bright. Can we do this? Can we do that? And it's like, I do actually prefer having people mixing with me mm. because if I'm just like alone in my cave, yeah, that's when it can go forever. Mm. The guy who's mixing um, my album right now, he has um, autism, and he was saying that's like a lot of mixers like sometimes will come on the spectrum. Oh, they can interesting. Just, like, shh, that makes a lot of just sense. Focusing on the mix. And they don't mind being in the cave. By the right. Way. Like, they prefer being right, alone right, right. and just, like, getting it done. And No, it's a good thing to be able to put your mind on. Yeah, totally. I was like, damn, that's crazy. Uh, so then, <clears throat> we're back to Harry Nielsen. Let's go back to Harry. <laughs> um, UCLA, a woman, a woman, try, try, try. I love that one, too. Try is a great song. Yeah. That was one that we had to send to the company to pull the vocals out of. Did you guys do all the background vocals too? You tracked the background vocals? Um, yes. Try yeah. had a stack of backgrounds in it already. Those women? Those yeah. Women. So some of them are still in there. Mm. But we put a gang of background vocals yeah. on every song. That's crazy. That's one thing that Mark is best known for is a wall of vocals. Wow. And he does them all himself. Really? Great. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, man, that that project is so so. Wait, so when I sorry, I, let's go back. I already messed up my thought, but um, the family reached out about getting this project started, or oh, sorry, yeah, back to this question. Yeah, sorry. Um, Mark and his late wife Una, mm-hmm. uh, they've been in touch forever, and you know. They're sort of rough recordings. Mm -hmm. So for her, I think she felt maybe it didn't showcase him at his best. Yeah. She was nervous about having it out there in the world. Mm -hmm. So Mark had been asking her to do this for a long time. Really? Yeah. And I think there's been sort of a renewed interest in his music lately. Yeah. And I think that she saw that and saw their kids growing up and playing music and just said it's time it's time yeah. it's time let's do it so yeah she gave the blessing and you know demos can be like you know of course it's not us at our best like it's not me at my best i'm just trying to get like this idea down right it's just like uh, okay i didn't really do it to click or anything yeah so no i love it because it's like there is greatness in there undoubtedly yeah it's like it's a demo, but there's yeah. there's magic in there. Totally. That's so... I don't know, man. Like, it felt like my friend was back. Yeah. In a weird way. Totally. Like, um, in, like, UCLA, when he hits that high note, like, ah, for me... I was like, dude, that's... That's that's Harry. Everybody... Everybody's talking. That's yeah. Harry. He still has it. Yeah. No matter how old he was, his voice was still great. And, you know, and yeah, seventies Harry, where he threw out his, he like lost his voice, but like, right, he sounds great still. Yep. 
Oh my god. It was it was emotional too. Yeah. Because Mark and him were, we're like real close. We're tight. Yeah. And so just putting up a solo vocal of his was like an experience. Wow. And you were there for all of it? Yeah. Wow. Someone asked uh, some questions on Instagram. Yeah. Let's, let's get see. into these questions. Let's do it. <clears throat> I should have had these pulled up. I didn't. Mm. Okay. Instagram. How does it feel to be part of a Grammy? Oh, great. Great? Great. What, what was yeah. the Grammy for? The Grammy was for uh, Juan Gabriel album. Oh, cool. Yeah, which I worked on a handful of, actually. Yeah. Um, Gustavo produced a bunch of his records, he was with him like for his hot streak in the 90s. Mm-hmm. And he sort of went away for a while too. And so we did a couple of like warm up albums, which are still on the shelf, by the way. Really? And hopefully it will come out at some point. Yeah. Uh, and then we did a duet album, which won Billboard Album of the Year. Mm-hmm. And it was just, it was a smash. And then we did duets too. Juan passed away unfortunately in the middle of making that record um so there's no plans for those final recordings over there that that again is like Mm -hmm. tied up with their family right now yeah but that was such a massive project it was like 16 or 18 songs every one of them is a duet yeah so it's like doing his vocal and then every artist has their own energy Mm mm-hmm strings all over the place, bunch of different mixers. So getting in the award was just like monumental. Yeah. Mixing or well, engineering the whole process like was I haven't heard that record at all, but like imagine it's like drums, bass, strings, guitar, acoustic guitars, lots of percussion, lots of guitars, lots of keys. Wow. And we're we talking eight hour days, ten hour days. How long? How big in the studio? Because I imagine he he only comes in for like the vocals, right? As an old, elderly man or older man, he had his spot in Cancun. Cool. And he he really liked to record with Gustavo. Oh, okay. So we'd go down there to work oh, with him. Oh, so you got to go to Cancun? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, if you, it was great. Yeah. And he, he'd put us up. And um, I'd get to work with him, but cool. he liked he to come in when he wanted to. He liked to have dinner and yeah. shuffle out in his jammies and That's awesome. just sit there with Gustavo and knock him out. I love that. Yeah, That's, it's nice and comfortable, and yeah, you can get the best performances when you're nice and comfortable. That's like for sure. That's like the whole thing with like we were just talking about this on, on another podcast about like, <clears throat> uh, like just feeling rushed in recordings. It's yeah, like, where it's like fuck, we're paying an hour. $100 an hour, and it's like, ugh, my drummer's taking too many takes, now we kind of need to get this, because you know, we yeah. got to move on the bass after this, and now we only have two hours left, and I, I've never gotten a great product out of that. You can't work like that. No. You just can't do it. And That's I, why yeah. this room is great. Yeah, because we can take our time, and we can come back in. If it's not happening that day, we can do another day. And, right. Yeah. I think, I don't know, has the industry kind of shifted to more like project-based budgets, Versus hourly? Very much so, yeah. I mean, there are just not any rules yeah. whatsoever. Um, I feel like most bands are doing a hybrid of mm-hmm. like going to a nice studio for a couple of days and then doing the rest in the garage. Yeah. So no pressure for vocals and guitar. What would you say? Everything. Put the drums in the nice studio? Where, where, where would you think would be the best parts of the band to be in a nice studio drums are the most crucial yeah because you need a bunch of mics Mm -hmm. a nice board a good sounding room yeah um that being said every time i do that i make the whole band set up including vocals because you often get great sounds and performances that playing live yeah yeah that you can't beat 
after the fact. Yeah. They never want to do that. <laughs> but they get it afterwards, yeah. you know? Yeah, because even if you play live, like, we were, for the first couple records, we were doing the same thing, like, where I would lead him live, and then we just use that live drum take. So at least the yeah. drums felt live, yeah. even if we, like, replaced it with everything else. But you still want, like, live feeling drums. It gives, like, this looseness yeah. versus, like, keeping everything to a nice grid. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Do you do... You do do you prefer, or well, I'm assuming you do either or, but like keeping things onto a grid and doing all the edits, like um, you want it to be kind of loose and feel natural. It's sort of genre based yeah. for me. Uh, bigger, poppier stuff. It's got to be tight. Is, yeah, yeah. you got to get grid it for the most wow. part. Um, but rock bands that I work with, I try to leave somewhat loose. I feel like, um, yeah, I guess that falls, that wouldn't fall under the mixing fixing all the grids and stuff like that right you know mixers does that fall do, on you or does that fall on again no rules mixers do probably a lot more of that than mm. you might imagine a lot of the editing Not that, that, that they that want to. i don't think they know yeah. and I, i've seen songs sent out before and had them come back gridded and have the producer go like i didn't ask you to do that oh. like that's not what i want at all oh or like tuning vocals after the fact and it's like no man i sent you the vocals done yeah don't, don't touch it damn yeah because mixing and editing i guess they kind of feel like they have to take that responsibility too i guess yeah and you know if you feel like you're fighting something when you're mixing it's so easy to just go you know what i can fix that yeah that's true uh we were just saying how we get so nervous when we get new mixes back yeah it's really nerve-wracking yeah you know, like, like what'd you do to my song <laughs> 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 or like or like uh, I don't know, like... Yeah. I, I totally get it. And then you're totally, like trying totally to give them notes, it. and you're like, well, you're a professional, but I guess you, you have to say what you want to hear. Yeah, if it's not what you want. Yeah, that's true. But I was like, well, you probably know best. And also, um, you know, sending stuff out to a bunch of great mixers. Yeah. Sometimes we get it back and just go, you know what, it's just, that's not it. And yeah. And we're going to abuse somebody else. And yeah. we're talking like multi-grammy platinum yeah. guys and the mix is great but it's just like not what you want that's not that's not it interesting yeah mixing could be so so vibe like vibe yeah not like perfect well drums usually say here then we do the bass here and it's like yeah it's so like eh, vibed out yeah absolutely that's crazy i don't know man Ugh, recording is like so hard but so fun i don't know it's like the last bit like i always focus so much on the perform the performance the live performances and now it's like getting more into recording it's just it's tough yeah it feels like it's part of the package now mm -hmm. you have to put out great. i don't know a lot of artists that are like really driving still and not engineering their own stuff that's true i just don't know how much budget there is now too like for a label to give you money to go into a nice studio um, and bands don't have that much money you know it's like, there's there's no such thing that Joey Mullen record yeah uh, that was a kickstarter oh cool so it was nice to have a budget but yeah. it's like it's not a label it's just it's still on our own wow do you think do you think we'll ever get back there to like nice budgets for a record <sighs> like putting the money into the actual audio or, I feel like the only people who haven't budged are music video people. They're the only ones who are like, I still need 10 grand. I'm right. Like, what? Like, for, yeah, for what? For what? Um, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Because like, I think we've gone away from thinking, like, why would we allocate this money to the recording? There's got to... In reality, that's the whole thing. That's what we're doing. That's like the whole... Right. That is the product. Yeah. I mean... Something needs to be figured out on the back end mm -hmm. as far as royalties and like yeah. just paying people for their work. When it starts talking about like points, that's when things get really confusing for me. Yeah. Like how many points does a producer get? Like I've never shared anything. So it's like, how's, do you know how that works at all? No. Yeah. I mean, I know like for example, Gustavo is getting a point or two on those records that we were doing which makes it for him 
unfortunately sort of like I can take a little less mm. and then hopefully look forward to something on the yeah. back end too. It's like a gamble. Yeah. A little oh. bit. Um, but I hope so. Yeah. Um, I don't know, man. I feel like that industry is going to change a lot real soon. I yeah. Think. Just how, how the money's being spent and cause it's more and more like we don't, we, we need them, but we also don't cause we can do it our own and right. YouTube thing and people got great experience on YouTube, but there's still like a, a nice, you could tell the difference. Like, you know, cause like Kevin Parker, it's like, Oh, well he records all of his Tame Impala stuff. He does it all himself. Yeah, he also has like thousand dollar gear. Like he has big yeah. gear. Yeah. They talk about him recording in his home, but like. They don't tell you what he's recording out of. That's true. Still, in that case, I would say that's because it's him. Yeah. And probably whatever he you put in year. front of him is going to be incredible. Yeah. Um, but so much of my job now is just when people feel like they hit their ceiling. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, I sort of know what I'm doing, but like, I want to take it to a pro. True. And like, go into a studio see what it's like to sing into a ten thousand dollar microphone yeah and then send it to ian and mario to mix are there moments where you're like ten thousand mic dollar microphones like well shit maybe we should just use the sure sm7 for sure <laughs> for sure well these get used for all the scratch vocals and totally. i keep those sometimes yeah you can't beat it dude they're great mics yeah i love them i love them um are there any more instagram people hmm any more Instagram oh, questions? Oh, yeah. Let's go back to the questions. Um, do you know Mickey Dolenz? No. Oh. These people think that you do. Uh, I recorded him. Really? Yeah. He sang background vocals on that Joey record. Oh. Um, Joey is touring in a band that plays the White Album straight through. Oh, cool. Uh, it's him, Christopher Cross, Mickey, I love it. and Jason Sheff from Chicago. Oh, cool. So they're riding around on a bus together singing the Beatles. The album? Yeah. That's cool. And um, so Joey was out here. And we said, man, we got to get Mickey in here to do something. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he just popped over from the valley and... One Heineken and yeah. <laughs> just blasted through it. That's cool, man. Yeah, these girls they they love they love Mickey Dolenz because then her sister responded, "Okay, tell me everything about Harry Nielsen's friendship with Mickey Dolenz." This is you can see their message in her. Okay, also like anything about Mickey Dolenz, really, <laughs> unless it's negative, then I don't want to hear it. He was really nice. <laughs> yeah, and he still has his full range. Really? So, yeah, he can sing. I saw the monkeys at the Chumash Casino. Yeah, right before uh, yeah. the passing of of uh, wh what's the guy's name? I don't know. Davy Jones. I'm Davy Jones. The, I was gonna I was gonna say the Brady Bunch. Who was the guy who was in the Brady Bunch movie? Yeah, Davy Jones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they're great, man. They sound fun. It was fun. It was awesome. And like you know, the Harry Nielsen connection. He like wrote songs for them. And yeah, yeah. What was really cool for me among other things, was that um, Mark is a great storyteller. Mm. So it's just stories, stories, stories. And um, it was fun to have Mickey come in, mm. and Mark shares the story with him, and then Mickey was like, oh, yeah, and then the next day, what you might not know is whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. So wow. I got a whole other perspective. Wow. Yeah, wild times. That is wild times, had. man. Like... Serious wild times being in LA in, in, in the seventies and Yeah. Especially post monkeys like fame, like Mickey Dolan's is still like a respected, like likable guy, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Doing the White Album though. <laughs> I know. Actually they played at the Wiltern and I, I was working with Mark that night. Hmm. I really wanted to go. But. Yeah. Did you listen to those uh white album like remixes and all those. a little bit yeah a little bit I yeah pretty good yeah um it, it's interesting to me because you can hear things that yeah new things which you know purists hate that <laughs> it's interesting as an engineer producer to me yeah it's like oh i never noticed that vocal or shaker or whatever mm -hmm. is going on back there 
Yeah, like we were just saying with like, um, this feels like, you know, this is like the last year that can really milk this Beatles thing. Because it's like the Peter Jackson, like, get back movie's going to come out. I don't know when. I just saw a YouTube video. It's getting, I guess it's getting Oh, close. I don't know what that is. Oh, so they got all the footage from, like, the get back documentary thing. And uh, Peter Jackson, like, took all that footage and he just made another movie with it. Apparently it's supposed to bust a myth that they were fighting that whole time. We'll see. Right on. We will right see. On. But, right uh, um, yeah. I don't know, man. They're, they're, it's, it's going to feel like the Beatles are breaking up again. Because I enjoyed this, like, run of the yeah. White Album, uh, Abbey Road, the latest Abbey Road mixes that came out. But also, it just sounds like it just beefed up the drums and beefed up the bass. Yeah. That's also a part it, of me that's it's like, just, okay. It it's a question cool. mark. Yeah. It's a little bit of a question mark. It's fun for me to listen to. I'll probably always go back to the Ridge. Yeah. But the mono mixes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always looking for those Beatle like uh, obviously those like first those first pressings, but like if you can get anything close to that, I'm like, yeah, I have like a, I have like one, I have a big uh, white album one. Really? Yeah, the cost a lot of money, but I like it. Nice. And it has like the original poster in it. I'm like, yeah, sick. yeah. I don't even play hang it. on to I that one. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I have a, a first pressing of Nielsen Aerial Ballet. Really? I got that Warbler in Santa Barbara. Nice. Yeah, for like twenty five bucks. I was like, damn, love that awesome. place. That record's so good, too. I don't know, man. Like, Nielsen, Beatles, definitely had the, the biggest effect on me. Like, um, and, you know, obviously, like, John Lennon was obsessed with, like, Nielsen, too. And Paul For McCartney. sure. And I wonder if Paul McCartney has listened to Lost and Found. That's a great question. That's a great question. It's a great question. Um, he certainly loved Harry. Yeah. I, I bet he probably gave it a listen. But I just, you know. It's hard to imagine what his life is like, so yeah. I'd what, rather what do you not think of, speculate. What do you think about the new Paul McCartney, so his newest stuff? It's so... I'm not really into it. It's so, like, new sounding. Yeah. Um, there was, like, a time and place. I think I was in my early 20s mm-hmm. and, like, really in that Beatles thing. Mm-hmm. And um, he put out Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, mm-hmm. which I like. Very much. There, I think there are a couple of great tracks on there. He played everything himself. Cool. And uh, it's pretty raw. And yeah. It kicks ass. Um, some of the new stuff, I don't know. <laughs> I to be honest, I haven't spent a lot of time. It has with like it. some of those like so, reverse symbol like. Sh- <laughs> yeah. Big drop. Ah, right. It's like, who's making those calls? He's not making those calls. You know? I don't think he's making those calls. No. Um. I also think, you know, the song's got to be there. Yeah. And whatever. He's blessed us with, it, <laughs> with enough, enough songs in his life. I like, um, I have heard some of those new songs, like versions of him just doing it acoustic. Like, oh, there's something there. Yeah. I think they just fucking blew it with the production. It's like really clean. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know what that is, man. I guess that's just like using like really nice equipment. I don't know. Is that a mixing thing? Like what gives us that like really crisp modern sound versus what we all kind of gravitate towards, which is that like seventies dry tone. I think that's production. Really? Yeah. I think they probably tried to, you know, it's like that leap from X and Y to Milo Mm -hmm. Zyloto for Mm -hmm. Coldplay. Yeah. Which was like, you hear a band on one and you hear X and Y was that last record I cared about from them, you know? Yeah. I like Milo Zyloto, but mm. it's just like, it's a, I don't hear a band on that yeah. record. And I think it's sort of the same thing. For, Do you think a lot of times it's not, it's actually not a band. It's like all programmed. Cause the um, drums sound like too programmed sometimes. Like them and the killers, even like black keys. Mm-hmm. I can tell they had their drummer come in and play but it's just like so gritted yeah, and loose, and, and it's so it's like I can hear the guys playing on it. It just it sounds like production with a vocal on top, yeah, more than like a band. A band. Um, do 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 you watch this guy on YouTube, Rick Beato? <laughs> <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. Um, sometimes. Yeah. 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 He has a. Uh, what does it sound like? The quantized John Bonham. 
Oh, I haven't seen that You gotta one. watch that one. It, yeah. Like, it's cool, like, it's on the grid, but, like, it loses, it loses something. Yeah. And he's pretty fucking, he was like, holy shit, he's like, looked, he, like, pulls up the Pro Tools and puts it on YouTube, and he's yeah. like, he's pretty on. Yeah. But, like, let's just move it this little center, and then it's like, yeah. I can't remember what song it was. Maybe one of the Levy Breaks or something like that, one of those songs. But, yeah, it just loses it. It loses that little something there. Yeah, and I've been lucky, like, with Keltner to record some, like, legendary studio guys. Yeah. And it's, like, how close they are to the grid just has, like, nothing to do with their greatness. Yeah. Because I've recorded drummers that are exactly on it and do not sound great. Wow. Yeah, like a Travis Barker one. Sure, yeah. Yeah, he's probably fucking perfect. He's, yeah, that's his have gig. You, have you seen his, um like, backstage routine? Yeah. That shit's crazy. He has, like, all the drum pads, and he's, like, click, 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 and he's, like, doing different kind of, like, and just you just hear the loud-ass click, clink, 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 like, click, 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 click. Yeah, I mean. I love that shit. I've recently gotten a Travis Barker kick the other day just watching his drum video. I go on it, you know, once or twice a year. Yeah. And it's, like, just that's, to be amazed. that's not the music I'm listening to yeah. day to day, but he's, like, one of the hardest working dudes Ever. Yeah, that's true. At least as far as drummers go. He just, like, he never stops. Um, who are you listening to right now? Um, I'm listening to Wilco right yeah. now. Uh, I was just giving the new Vampire Weekend cool. a spin. Yeah. I think What'd those think guys you? do some great stuff. Yeah. They do, like, a magic trick, which is when they come out with a record, I put it on. And I go, like, I don't get it. Yeah. Like, I don't really get it. And then a couple weeks later, I'm, like, I have, like, a melody in my head, and mm -hmm. I don't even know who it is, but now I want to hear it. And I'm, like, oh, that's off that Vampire Weekend <laughs> record. And then it becomes my favorite song. Damn. Um, I'm still a Strokes diehard. Oh, is that? Yeah, they just released a new track, right? Yeah. They've got an album coming out. That's cool. Going to see them at the forum in a bit. Oh, really? Yeah. That's cool. They have. Uh, they just did that Bernie Sanders rally. Yeah, they did. That's cool. Yeah. And they did New Year's Eve with like Mac DeMarco. Yeah. Also. Oh, speaking of, I saw Mac at the Greek. Oh, really? Last year. How was that? Phenomenal. Yeah? Phenomenal. Was he with the band or by himself? He was with the band. Okay, cool. Yeah, he's a nut. Yeah. He's a total nut. Yeah. But just like, I was blown away. Yeah, he's great. Like, his band right now is, like, the best band I've seen him with. For sure. They just have, like, the he's just, like, years of touring with his friends, and now he has, like, new guys. Like, let's just get the fucking best players available. Yeah. He's like, I've, I'm, I feel like I'm at that place right now. I'm like, I'm just getting the fucking best people around me. Right. Love it. Let them play, and we'll yeah, sound good. I, it was I just want to sound good. Right? Who doesn't? Yeah. It was so cool, though, because he'd, like, go over and pick up a guitar and start tuning and be like, I don't want to play guitar, and literally just put it down and you do it. You gotta be like, all right, and pick up the guitar and like, Damn. that was it. <laughs> That's crazy. I like, uh, yeah, the strokes are always great. I haven't, um, listened to like a lot of their newer stuff. The classics are, yeah. are where it's at with yeah. them. The They're, first three. Yeah. You count. Uh, um, however, every album they put out there are two or three songs that I think like are in there for sure. Yeah. And yeah. I'm always just curious to hear what they're up to. Yeah, what were your thoughts on Angles? Um, I, I like a lot of it. I think a lot, at the time I liked it, and then I just haven't revisited it. All. Yeah. There's a song on there called Two Kinds of Happiness, mm -hmm. which was like almost one of their best songs, mm. and it kind of went haywire <laughs> somewhere along the way. In the in the recording? Uh, in the, in the arrangement. In the arrangement, yeah. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, yeah, same thing. Sometimes I'm driving. I loved, I loved that Julian record, that solo record he put out. For sure. I thought that was really good. Yeah. Yeah. And um, his stuff with Daft Punk. Yeah. That's the shit. That's cool, too. Yeah. I yeah. Hmm. Like, I saw uh, Mac DeMarco, and he did Running With The Devil by Van Halen. Nice. And yeah. He always comes up with a good cover, man. He's he always did got one uh, great cover. He did Enter Sandman. Oh, yeah. I've seen him do that one, too. <laughs> Yeah. That's nuts, man. I've never been in the covers, though. Covers is like a a place I haven't gotten into. Um, Wilco 
does a cover of True Love Will Find You in the End. Oh, that's great. By Daniel Johnston. Mm-hmm. And whew, you give it a spin. Yeah, I got to listen to that one. To me, that's like almost the definitive version of that song. Yeah. Um, which Wilco album are you listening to right now? Um, I like the whole love. Yeah, that one's still great. I love yeah. that one. Um, Summer Teeth was my introduction to them. Like, oh, cool. Like late. Late, not anywhere near where it came when out. When it came out, yeah. So I was, I don't know what this band is, and I got deep into that record, Sky Blue Sky. Yeah, that was the first one I got into. <sighs> Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Amazing album. I, I went backwards. Sky yeah. Blue Sky, I, Sky Blue Sky, when it came out, I think I was like a junior in high school, and I heard a, I heard um, it on a commercial, one of the songs on a commercial, and then I just worked my way backwards. Yeah. Like, Damn, this is crazy. And then again, I haven't tracked as closely with the last couple. Yeah. They kind of just been dropping them. Yeah. And it's like, there's no lead up. There's no like marketing. It's just like, Oh, we put an album. Right. Here's Star Wars. Yeah. You know, okay. Yeah. Download it if you want. Sure. I will. <laughs> I did. I did. Um, and then he does the ones with, you know, Tweety with his son. And right. It's kind of hard to catch up, but like, yeah, there's a lot of great stuff. I still love that band so much. He is unbelievable. I saw them at the Arlington. Yeah. And then I saw him by himself at the Granada. Nice. Yeah. That's yeah. like the only guy I could go see the band and then just see him and be just as satisfied. I've never seen him solo. Mm, it's cool. He does all the songs. I've heard. I've yeah. heard. Yeah. Wilco is like a warm hug. <laughs> yeah, I love that. We were just talking about this again on the other part, but like, I love that um, documentary, I'm Trying to Break Your Heart. Mm-hmm. And then it's like that's what mm-hmm. kind of inspired me to like keep looking at these mics and oh nice yeah because he uses one right and uh, it just gets me hyped for like a tour or recording session I'll watch that and be like, oh, oh yeah I'm ready I'm ready yep I want to do that that the Oasis doc I love that Oasis phenomenal mm hmm I just love the Gallagher brothers so much those They're just guys so are nuts. out of their gourds <laughs> I don't really so like crazy. Noel's music but like. I like Liam. I still like Liam. I thought that Liam last Liam record was cool. But yeah, they still do good stuff. Um, I saw the High Flying Birds um, at Coachella. Was it good? The Oasis songs were great. Yeah, yeah. It was fucking awesome. I'm like that right now with uh, Morrissey. I've seen Morrissey twice. First time was mind blowing. Second time, I'm like, okay, I get it. And now I'm like, I should go see Johnny Marr because he does like yeah. way more Smith songs. Yeah, yeah. Like I'd look at like his videos online. And he, Morrissey does two Smith songs, and you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> I know. And then the rest of the set, you're like, okay. Just shut up and play the hit. Shut up and play the Smiths. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> but yeah, with Johnny Marr, I've noticed that he'll do more Smith songs, and now I'm like, shit, I should go to one of his shows. For sure. But there is something special about seeing Morrissey for the first time, even though he's problematic as fuck. <laughs> he's so problematic. Yeah. It's hard to defend him, which I don't. But... <laughs> He's it's hard, to, he's it's hard a, just to be a fan. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. He's so he's so shirtless all the time and angry. Mm-hmm. And then really, people are just trying to grab him and drag him into the crowd. And he's like, Ugh. yeah. Like I feel like he's mad at me when I'm watching him. I love it. But a true legend. He is. Yeah. Yeah. One of the greats. Do you see that lineup? Uh, the Cruel World with Morrissey, Bauhaus. That's happening in LA. No. Where is that? It looks pretty good. It's like, I don't know. It's not the Greek, but it's like a festival type thing. And it looks pretty good. It's like almost $200. I'm like, I don't know if I'd go. But it's cool. It has like, you know, Bauhaus. Um, fuck. I can't remember any of the other bands. But it's like, I think Psychedelic Furs. Like that kind of like vein of like right. 80s. Right. Alternative. 80s indie rock. It, it could be worth it. I don't know. Yeah, it could be cool. Um. Oh, this is a whole conversation on its go own. Go ahead, go, go, go. But uh, Ryan Adams has always been, like, my dude. That's awesome. Um, and still, to me, still every album he puts out, yeah, just like my jaws on the floor. Yeah. Which I know he's got some issues now yeah. as well. Speaking of problematic artists. And, you know, I've been around long enough now that... How do you feel about, like, separating art from the artist? <sighs> That's what made me think of him was talking yeah. about Morrissey. Yeah. Because it's like it's Morrissey. Yeah. Forever. Forever, yeah. Like he's yelling at me <laughs> from the stage with his shirt off, but yeah. it's still Morrissey. I know. 
Um, it's really hard to know where to draw the line. Totally. Um, I mean, there are some things where you're, you just draw it. Yeah. And he is in somewhat of a gray area to me. Yeah. It's like, I feel like he's been a known quantity Mm -hmm. just for being like out there his whole career. Yeah. He has like some like, you know, weird thoughts and opinions, but at the end of the day, those are his opinions. Yeah. Listen to the songs on his opinions and. And uh, there's like certain like R. Kelly. That's like actual. That's a line. That's like actual crimes. So that's you can't listen line. to R. Kelly, you know. Right. And then, but like Morris, it's just it's just his opinion. He's, if you think he's an idiot, you think he's an idiot. Right. That's fine. He, he, he's an idiot. Yep. I'm still gonna go watch the show. It, but then again, like I saw him once. I'm like, that's good. My girlfriend hadn't seen him, so we went for the second time, and I was like, okay. That's. She was like, yeah, I just needed to see him once. For sure. Yeah. It's. It's worth it. Just to get that like first look at him. I don't know what that is. I don't know any other... Um, like Paul McCartney... I saw Paul McCartney at the Hollywood Bowl like almost 10 years ago now, actually. And that was one of those moments where I was like, holy shit, that's him. And you see him on the stage. And I was a little late to the show, but he does a three-hour set. Yeah. So I didn't really miss much. I missed the 10% of the show. And then uh, he was like singing, and I was walking up the steps. I was like, holy shit, that's actually him. I know. Like, there he is. There he is. And he sound he still sounded really great back then. I think he still sounds pretty good, but like ten years ago he sounded really good. He still sounded really I've good. seen him a few times. Yeah. I saw him in two thousand nine mm-hmm. and he was still like doing high kicks. Yeah, and, and he like can hit those high notes and man, just, it. just tears the yeah. whole time. Every time I, I see him. I I cried the first time I saw him. Right. I was like, Oh my god. Um, and all the stuff that like led up to it, like me hoping my car didn't break down, me like getting the fucking like three hundred dollar ticket, however much it costs to see him. Right. Parking. It's always an ordeal. Late. Yeah. yeah. Um and then yeah, I saw him at Dodger Stadium a couple years ago. Oh cool. And he still kicked ass. Yeah. But he was it was a little rougher. It's a little rougher. A little rougher. Yeah, but still. I think what I would like to see is him to go out and just do some wings. Yeah. Just just, just I just want to hear the wings. Um, I was on my way. London town. Yeah. I was driving home with my girlfriend the other day and I'll just like chuck my phone at her Mm -hmm. because I'm always trying to DJ while I'm driving. She's like, you're going to crash. You're going to (laughs) crash. So I chuck it at her and I was like, put wingspan on. Let's have, let's listen to some wings. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I don't, I don't think I know any wings. It's like, you know, wings. You're about to learn. You know, you know, (laughs) wings. you don't know that you know wings, but you know, wings. And yeah, I mean, Jet, Jet, Band on the Run. Yep, they, they still make me weep. They're so so good. Um, there's a great documentary on YouTube right now of him, like 1976, like touring. I don't know, maybe around the United States. Uh, I just watched it recently, and it's so good. He like his voice sounds so good. Yeah, too, in 76. was that like, like the mullet era? Like the mullet. That's yeah. why I got myself a mullet. Oh, Christopher nice. Christopher Paul. Yeah, really. Okay, yeah. right on. I kept looking at his and I was like, dude, I want like a wings like mullet. That mullet. I know. His looks- it's a specific mullet. Yeah. He keeps his like really short and like front forward. I don't really yeah. do that. It's but, like yeah. it's still British here. Yeah. And then a party in the back. Yeah. The mullet's back, man. People keep telling me, Oh, the mullet's gonna come back. I was like, It's back. It's here. I can't really I meet, do it. I meet tons of people with mullets. Oh, you, you should try it. Because my hair like does this oh, versus it poops up. like yeah. It doesn't fall. Right. Yeah. No, but I promise you it will. <laughs> <laughs> That's what people tell me. I, I don't promise know. you. Mine doesn't really fall, but the way you cut it, it looks like it falls. Right. Yeah, because it starts yeah. tailing back here, like making a little tail. And then they say you can train it. Not my hair. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I wants to do. That's awesome. Is there any other interesting notes about recording that Nielsen record? <sighs> I'm trying to think. Anything you learned in that process? Um, wow. Yeah. That is quite a question. Let's go. I, I mean, I feel like Mark has been a great mentor mm-hmm. to me as well. He's a, he's a great songwriter too. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I learned production from him, mixing from him. He's not a mixer, mm-hmm. but just having him standing over my shoulder, like yelling, do this, do that. Mm-hmm. 
don't think so much. Mm-hmm. Um, he always tells me there's no room for subtlety in mixing. And that's been a great lesson for me. Yeah. Because people in Pro Tools will definitely, and I'll be like, no, if I say turn it up, crank it. Yeah. Yeah. Blow my speakers out, and then I'll tell you, tell you to turn it down. Yeah. That's always good. Um, what did I learn on that record? Minus the the process of digitizing and <laughs> just getting the yeah. lead vocal out, the, building a complete track around his singing, which is not to click, which is, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't know, man. You guys, didn't, it, you guys didn't fix any vocal parts either. It's just that it is what it was. It, yeah, it is as it was. Yeah. Um, it was just wild because Keltner, all these guys were guys that knew him yeah. and loved him. And it was just like, it was really wild to see how much like one guy had impacted. It just like rippled out through all of these great artists, yeah. musicians in LA. That's going to stick with me. Totally. Cause it's like. I don't know. I'm a drummer again. So yeah. just having Jim Keltner in the room. That's awesome. Is a thing. And you'd be like, do you want to play on Harry's stuff? And he's like, duh, <laughs> like just name it. I'm, yeah. I'm there. That's like, awesome. Wow. All right. That's so cool. Well, hell yeah, man, dude. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for thanks having for talking me, talking about Harry Nielsen. Yeah. It's my favorite. It's good to see you. I'm glad dude, to good be to see here, you too, man. Hell yeah. yeah. Keep keep the band going. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a fan. Thanks, man. Yeah, the band will continue. The podcast will continue. Keep Santa Barbara on the map. I yeah. I feel like sometimes there's a pressure of me to do that, and <laughs> I'm not taking that responsibility on. But I will continue to do as much as I can. Cheers. Cheers, man. Cheers. <sighs>